Good afternoon, my name is Lisa Wadeen. I'm the chair of the Department of Political Science at the University of Chicago, and it is my pleasure and privilege to welcome Stathis Kalibas back to the University of Chicago. We welcome him back in two senses. He received his PhD from the University of Chicago in 1993. He also was a faculty member in the Department of Political Science from 2000 to 2003, and you can come back anytime you want. Not just to give a talk, I mean to stay. Currently, Professor Kalivas is Arnold Wolfer's Professor of Political Science and Director of the Program on Order, Conflict, and Violence at Yale University. He is the author of two exceptional books, The Logic of Violence and Civil War, which is a Cambridge University Press book from 2006, and his previous The Rise of Christian Democracy in Europe, Cornell University Press, 1996. He's also the co-editor of Order, Conflict, and Violence, Cambridge University Press, 2008. He has received several awards, including the Woodrow Wilson Award for Best Book on Government, Politics, or International Affairs, that's 2007, the Lubert Award for Best Book in Comparative Politics, 2008, the European Academy of Sociology Book Award, 2008, the J. David Greenstone Award for Best Book in Politics and History, 1997, and the Gregory Lubert Award for Best Article in Comparative Politics in both 2001 and 2009. Professor Kalivas has been awarded fellowships and grants by the Euro European University Institute, the Harry Frank Guggenheim Foundation, the United States Peace Institute, or Institute of Peace, and the Folk Bernadotte Academy. He is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation. He is currently researching various aspects of conflict, including the dynamics of violence and participation, and the evolution and transformation of civil wars. Please join me in welcoming back Professor Stathis Khalifa. Thank you very much. It's a great privilege and a great pleasure to be here, uh, especially in this room where I watched so many movies when I was a graduate student. So I really appreciate uh, uh, the, the use of this particular room. Uh, what I'm going to uh, give you today a sense of uh, is, uh, in very general terms, uh, uh, the uh, way in which I see the evolution of civil wars over time uh, by uh, emphasizing a few points that very often get lost, both in uh, current scholarship, but also in the way we approach civil wars, we, we, because we tend to very often have a very uh, short-term uh, view of these processes. Uh, by way of introduction, and without going very deep into definitional issues, which can be very complicated when speaking about civil wars, I will just define them as internal <laughs> wars, wars that take place within countries, even though very often those wars entail the participation of outside actors. Uh, and by way of motivating the study of civil wars, I could mention a lot of different factors. I'm just going to underline the human cost and political instability that these kinds of conflicts create. Uh, and also the fact that those conflicts have become, are today the main form of warfare, the main form of war. If you look at the evolution uh, of wars, you see this gray mass represents uh, civil wars, whereas this black uh, trend represents interstate wars. So when we speak uh, after the end of the Second World War of war, we tend to, um, in a sense, speak of civil war um, almost exclusively, which makes these kinds of conflicts very uh, important to study. The question I would like to address today is the extent to which and the forms of transformation of civil wars, the extent to which these wars have changed over time, and the, the reason why I decided to focus on this issue is if you look at the very rich and expanding literature in political science in, and in some other fields on civil wars, what you're likely to see is an emphasis on the homogenous character of civil wars over time and across uh, space. Most studies in political science emphasize and focus on civil wars after 1945. And that has implications about how we understand civil wars and about how eventually we also think in terms of policy recommendations about them. And the main debate that has taken place in the last few years about civil wars, the so-called greed versus grievance debate, which I'm going to illustrate very uh, quickly, is an implication of this lack of historical perspective. Uh, the main argument that some economists made uh, recently uh, 
is that civil wars can be understood as primarily criminal enterprises, that uh, rebels are just uh, criminals or robbers. This is uh, a statement by Paul Collier, who has been very influential. He's an economist formerly at the World Bank, presently at Oxford. Uh, but also in economic models of civil wars, people have emphasized this non-political dimension uh, of civil wars. Uh, that goes against um, another view by uh, political theorists and thinkers, and I chose to illustrate it with a statement by quotation by Carl Schmitt, a very well-known political thinker, who made exactly the opposite point that economists today make, uh, namely that the, the way in which, the only way we can distinguish uh, civil wars from uh, other types of activity is the political character of the rebels. So civil wars not only are not criminal, he claimed, but they are exceedingly political. They are the most political of wars. However, both views, in a sense, assume a homogeneous character of wars, that you can think of all wars being the same. However, a very cursory view of rebels uh, suggests otherwise. This is Charles Taylor, the leader uh, of uh, uh, one of the armed factions that fought in Liberia and then became the, the uh, president of that country and is now uh, indicted uh, by an international tribunal. And this is the poster child of the people who understand civil wars are criminal, as criminal activities. And that would be uh, a very different perspective, Che Guevara, who uh, is very often perceived and understood as the quintessential um, ideological rebel. So we have a wide range of variation. And so what I'm going to try to do is understand what allows us to explain this variation, this heterogeneity. And we can think of it in two ways. We can think of it uh, as temporal or historical. So civil wars and the rebels that are fighting in civil wars changing over time. But we can also think of it uh, in terms of cross-section, that in any given point in time, we have uh, armed groups that may, may be motivated primarily by one kind versus another kind of motivation. And what I'm going to argue today is that those two types of variations are uh, interrelated. And I'm going to do that by broadening the focus of uh, the, uh, uh, our lens of the analysis of civil wars by introducing a very uh, rough periodization. Uh, it's very difficult to talk about all those issues in a very short talk. So the 19th century will be the first part. I'm then going to talk very, very quickly about the first part of the 20th century, turn to the period of the Second World War and the Cold War, and conclude with the post-Cold War period, the present and the future of civil wars. And I'd like to make two preliminary distinctions. The first emphasizes is warfare. Um, we can think of irregular wars in terms of how they fought as being either irregular or guerrilla wars or not being irregular or guerrilla wars. And this tends to be a distinction that is often forgotten, even though the American Civil War is one uh, of the main conventional civil wars in history. But how, as I'm going to make um, uh, an argument um, in a few minutes, very often the way we understand civil wars is as being exclusively irregular um, or guerrilla-based, meaning uh, that they're fought by rural-based um, armed actors who very often um, operate by ambush, avoid direct uh, confrontation. Uh, and so keep in mind those two categories, and I'm going to uh, return to them. A second distinction we can make is by uh, looking at the goals of the rebels. And we can think of rebels that have revolutionary goals, whatever those may be, but entailing a radical social and political transformation of the society in which they fight versus those who do not have those goals. Now, if we do a sort of telescoping, a very um, rough historical analysis and go back to the 19th century, we notice a quite uh, interesting um, uh, inside, uh, it, we observe that most civil wars fought in the 19th century tended to be conventional wars. Wars fought between pretty much regular armies across clearly defined uh, front lines with decisive military battles deciding the outcome. There were few of those in Europe during the 19th century. They were mostly located in the Americas, especially Latin America was a place in which through the process of state building taking place a lot of those civil wars um, proved to be quite decisive. If we look, however, at the concept of revolution, we find that this concept tends not to be associated with civil war. Most revolutions tend to be urban uprisings. And in fact, the main revolutionaries of the time, people like Marx and later on Lenin, display in their writings a very big uh, dislike of guerrillas whom they very often identify with hooligans and bandits, precisely the view that economists have today. For them, serious revolutionaries are people who organize and fight uh, urban insurrections primarily. And so 
The third point that I would like to make about the 19th century is that uh, most irregular conflicts are not civil wars. There is a disconnect between the irregularity of warfare and the fact that it's a civil war. And most of those wars that entail an irregular character are wars of imperial conquest uh, and, and colonial conquest. Uh, the typical example of such a war can be glimpsed in a famous film of the 1960s, I think, Zulu, which describes how an inorganized uh, band of uh, native um, um, Zulu fighters in what is today South Africa uh, fights against a British invading battalion and completely gets destroyed. It's almost a slaughter, not even a war. So that's what very often people have in mind when they describe irregular wars. There is an exception to that, and that exception is the guerrilla war in Spain against Napoleon. And it's very interesting that this particular war is going to provide the main insight for the development of theories about irregular war, both in people like uh, Carl Schmitt, but also uh, Karl von Clausewitz. But overall, that's the pattern of the 19th century. If we turn to the first part of the 20th century, what we find is a structural change. Because for the first time, revolution changes. And instead of being just an urban uprising, becomes a conventional war. The civil wars of Russia, of Finland, or of Spain are typical examples of those wars of the first part of the 20th century where organized armies conventionally fight against each other. Even though we have a lot of other types of fighting, those tend to be pretty dominant. And these are uh, a byproduct of international development, especially after the formation of the Soviet Union. Uh, that uh, country plays a very big role uh, in helping and assisting various forces um, that fight in these kinds of civil wars, the best example being Spain. Irregular warfare as a form of interstate conflict is arising in the colonies, in which uh, non-pacified, quote unquote, areas uh, in colonies tend to face uh, or react to the encroachment of colonial powers using this type of irregular fighting. However, these are highly localized traditional insurgencies and not very effective ones. Almost all the time, they get defeated. If you look at the distribution of outcomes, you find that in the, 19th, the first part of the 20th century, most of those uh, local insurgencies get uh, defeated quite quickly um, by the colonial powers. And we have, for the first time, the slow emergence of a different type of guerrilla war about which I'm going to talk. And this happens in China in the 1930s. And it's a process that happens through trial and error. Um, and let's turn now to the third period on which I'm going to spend slightly more time. And this is the period um, that starts with the Second World War and then becomes the Cold War. This is a period in which there is a very fundamental change in the way in which insurgencies are organized. And those take, th that change takes place during the Second World War, both in Europe and Asia. A series of insurgencies known as partisan or, or resistance wars is going to prove quite effective in fighting against foreign occupiers. The uh, eve of the era of decolonization, especially in Vietnam and later on in Algeria, is going also to confirm this change with the emergence of uh, anti-colonial resistance movements that are organized uh, and fight via irregular war. But the watershed event in the Cold War, I would argue, following Eric Hobsbawm, is the Cuban Revolution of 1953. Because it's uh, an irregular war that proves very effective and extremely inspiring. And so for the first time, people across the globe who have revolutionary aspirations are going to start thinking that the best way, and perhaps the only way, to implement social revolution, especially in the South, is by fighting and organizing in a regular fashion. And they believe that this is effective. And the reason they believe so is also because of the proliferation of doctrines about how to do it, the most uh, famous of which are by Mao Tse Tung and Che Guevara. There is, however, a very large list of potential um, arguments about how to do it. Uh, this is also the time in which uh, powers who are fighting against uh, these kinds of um, insurgencies organize and, and elaborate a doctrine, which is going to be known as counterinsurgency doctrine. And the pioneers in that field are the French, because of their experience in Indochina and Algeria. And out of that kind of initial uh, work, a new theory, which is almost a social theory, is going to emerge the theory of counterinsurgency, which is going to become very popular during the Vietnam Wars uh, years uh, in the United States. So the main change that we observe during that period is that irregular warfare becomes the model form of revolution. Uh, and at the same time, we also observe that civil war becomes, so to speak, 
irregularized and turns revolutionary. So the three concepts we even today associate with each other to a degree that we think they're tautological, that is irregular war, revolution, and civil war, this association is a product of the period uh, of the Second World War and the Cold War. If we want to move uh, and try to use these kinds of insights from the past in order to understand the present and the future, I think we, no we need to introduce a couple of um, refinements from a conceptual perspective. The first one which I would like to introduce is the concept of robust insurgency, and the second one is the concept of technologies of rebellion. What do I mean by that? I, I would argue that robust insurgency is an evolved form of irregular warfare. It's a technology of asymmetric warfare that allows weaker actors to face stronger actors with a higher probability of success. It's a form of rebellion that turns absolute weakness into relative weakness that allows uh, irregular actors, if not to win outrightly, to at least blood uh, uh, or produce wars of attrition that weaken uh, very stronger, uh, much stronger governments by avoiding direct contact, by avoiding direct engagement. And one of the key features of robust insurgency has nothing to do with fighting per se. It has to do about the ability to, in a sense, out-administer the government in areas that are controlled by rebels, create, in a sense, a counter-state which is both more effective and very often uh, may project different ideals in terms of uh, the ideology of the rebels. It also is a form of combat that places, places a tremendous amount uh, of premium on discipline, precisely because of the difference, the relative difference in uh, military capacity, and also that makes, posits, introduces high requirements um, in terms of civilian collaboration, of how the civilian population should be involved in the war. It's a kind of conflict in which the civilians have to be associated with the military effort of both of either side if either side wants to prevail. So the bottom line which I would like you to, uh, which I would like to underline is that uh, unlike what a lot of people think, irregular war in that form is not just gang warfare in the jungle, it's a much more concerted, difficult, and deep effort uh, than the term would imply. The, uh, Carl Schmitt, the theorist whom I mentioned before, has a very nice description uh, of this change uh, when he says in, in his, his very, very insightful book, The Theory of the Partisan, that what revolutionary Marxism did uh, was to establish a connection between what he called the defensive autonomous, uh, autochthonous defender of home and the aggressive international revolutionary activist. I think it's, this is a very consequential insight that gives us a lot of uh, traction in order to understand this type uh, of insurgency. And in uh, quoting, uh, in, in thinking about it in that fashion, Carl Schmitt quotes uh, a famous um, French counter-revolutionary thinker, uh, Joseph de Mestre, who in 1811 pointed out that the real danger from his perspective of defense of order was the association of philosophy with the elemental forces of insurrection. Uh, and I think both of those perspectives give us an understanding of what is qualitatively different in robust insurgency from uh, traditional guerrilla fighting. And that has implications about what we may describe as a process of rebel governance. If you compare the two forms, traditional guerrilla warfare that was fought by local networks or local indigenous peoples against, say, colonial encroachment on the one hand and robust insurgency on the other hand, you are likely to see that the people who take the upper hand, the organization of the fighting, the beliefs that, um, in, uh, that uh, dominate in these kinds of situations, the war doctrine and the military resources that are used uh, differ. Uh, and I think this is an important distinction to make because we tend to collapse traditional guerrilla war with robust insurgency in one category and think that they represent the same phenomenon when in fact they represent a qualitative change. I'll give you two examples just to motivate uh, this distinction. The first one comes from Greece in 1944. It's a statement by uh, a British liaison officer who was associated with the communist partisans who were fighting against the German occupation. And he describes a situation in the mountains of Greece in which, as he uh, points out, the benefits of civilization and culture trickled into the mountains for the first time. Schools, local government, law courts, and public utilities, which the war had ended, worked again. And he goes on in describing the kinds of goods, collective goods, but also uh, the type of administration that the rebels were able to bring in in those mountainous areas. A more recent example comes from Afghanistan. There, uh, the kinds of collective goods are different. 
But the same kind of logic seems to prevail. The Taliban, in many of the areas they control, seem to be able to implement the kind of state rule and state authority that the central state cannot possibly implement. Uh, a recent example from the New York Times uh, states that uh, across large parts of the country, the Taliban operate shadow governments complete with appointed judicial and security officials that in many places are more influential than the official, than the official government and security forces. So there is a capacity to out-administer the government, which I mentioned before. I'll give you three examples now to give you a sense of how this type of fighting is not this, the, the, or this type of war is not the only one. And, and this introduces also the concept of um, rebel technology. If you think about rebel institutions, the institutions that the rebels set up in the places they control, and the primary method they use to recruit people, in three potential examples, Nigeria, the war in Biafra of the 1970s, Sierra Leone in the 1990s, and Nepal in the late 1990s, early 2000s, you find three very different types of activity. In terms of institutions, the war in Nigeria relied on pre-existing ones, the war in Sierra Leone had very little. Very often, the rebels behaved as predatory uh, bandits uh, or dependent on, on, on traditional rule, uh, but without really intervening. And the uh, war in Nepal very often called for new institutions built from scratch. If you look at the forms of recruitment, you find that there is a correlation that in uh, Nigeria in the 1970s, the main way to recruit people in the rebel army was through conscription, very much like a normal army would do very much like the South in the United States did uh, during the uh, Civil War. Um, uh, in um, Sierra Leone, the main way to recruit was through forcible ab abductions, very often of young children, uh, or kidnapping. And in Nepal, uh, uh, a, a form of recruitment that was common, even though not unique, was uh, voluntary recruitment. We may change the name of the countries and replace them with names of concepts. And that would give us three types of civil wars, the conventional civil wars that I mentioned before, on the one hand, the um, irregular civil wars that I also mentioned, and then the third type, which I describe as symmetric, but not conventional. And I'm going to explain what I mean by those terms. But basically, what that implies is a situation uh, in which irregular war emerges when there is a difference between the military capacity of the rebels, which is low, and those of the state, which is high. A conventional civil war, uh, civil war entails an asymmetry between rebels and governments at a high level of military capacity. And a symmetric non-conventional war entails a symmetry again, but at a very low level of, te of technological capacity. Uh, so we have three types of wars. Uh, in terms of conventional wars, we can think of pitched battles, front lines, heavy weaponry. The classic examples that come to mind are the American or the Spanish Civil War. But also a lot of the recent post-Soviet wars, and even the war in East Congo, had elements that uh, would place those kinds of conflicts uh, closer uh, to conventional wars than to uh, irregular wars. In fact, the biggest um, armed uh, military battle in Africa uh, between uh, armed formations uh, of the South African supporting the UNITA rebels in Angola and the government of Angola took place in the mid-'90s. Uh, if we look at symmetric non-conventional wars, these would be wars in which everyone, including the state, is very poorly armed and very poorly organized. And these are often wars described as pre-modern or as primitive. And wars in Sierra Leone, Liberia, or Somalia come to mind. Uh, by this distinction, uh, what I want to do is to emphasize the form of heterogeneity that is associated with other characteristics that we often, very often, uh, point out. So if we look at the trends during uh, the uh, uh, Cold War, and the end of the Second World War. In terms of that categorization, what we would find is a domination of irregular war, even though this domination is not complete. Um, slightly more than 50% of all civil wars during that period are fought irregularly. But a good uh, pr proportion of, of those conflicts, and that covers the entire period through 2004, are fought conventionally. And some of them are fought uh, by a symmetric non-conventional warfare. However, if you split. Uh, the distribution between the Cold War on the one hand and the post-Cold War period, you find a very important shift. And that shift is that uh, the following one. During the Cold War, irregular war tends to dominate. After the Cold War, irregular war declines very, very, very steeply. Uh, it's no longer the dominant form of warfare, which it was during the Cold War. So my argument would be that we are in the process of observing a similar shift 
in types of war that we observed uh, in the, peri the former periods, the 19th century and the first part of the 20th century. Uh, this is just a graph that shows the change in the propensity of irregular war as a percent of civil wars fought by decade after the end of the Cold War. And this just gives you a sense of the change uh, of civil wars in incidents, uh, which tends to correlate with this change in technology in different regions of the world. And what that tells you is that civil wars during the Cold War tended to be, to a very large degree, an Asian, Latin American, and African phenomenon. After the end of the Cold War, they become a Eurasian phenomenon initially, following the collapse of the Soviet Union and Yugoslavia, and primarily an African, sub-Saharan African phenomenon afterwards. So not only does the change uh, uh, in terms of types of civil wars fought um, be quite uh, substantial, but also the location of civil wars changes in which, which are very consistent with the type of change. Um, what does that, all of that bring us in a very, very compressed way? Uh, it suggests uh, that civil war today primarily is fought in ways that are very often uh, consistent with some of the descriptions that economists have emphasized, even though their logic may be very different. But a lot of the wars that are fought today con uh, in, across the globe tend to be wars of very low technology. It suggests a disconnect uh, between uh, civil war on the one hand and what we call uh, insurgency or robust insurgency on the other hand, a connection that we took for granted throughout the period of the Cold War. That raises the question whether we're facing uh, the end of robust insurgency, of the type of evolution of irregular war that was so characteristic uh, of uh, the Cold War period, the kind of war that very often people described as Maoist people's war, and the kind of war that has motivated to a very large extent the rewriting of the uh, doctrine, of the counterinsurgency doctrine of the uh, US military. Uh, and that, of course, raises the question, what about Iraq and Afghanistan? Uh, and the argument that I would like to, uh, to make is that despite the uh, very high significance of those wars in terms of American foreign policy, those wars do not represent uh, the typical civil wars of the post-Cold War period. They're outliers. Uh, and of course, as outliers, they have um, they may motivate US policy to a very large degree because of the resources uh, that the US has invested in those places and the importance of those places uh, in American policy. But at the same time, uh, there is a danger that the complete rewriting of counterinsurgency policy to fit precisely this type of combat may be out of place with the main trends of the period. It raises a second type of question, which I would like to very briefly address, whether jihad whether Islamist militancy may be uh, the new form of revolutionary ideology motivating potentially new insurgencies in the post-Cold War period, whether, in a sense, jihad is the new form of revolutionary Marxist-Leninism in functional terms. Uh, and one of the very interesting findings of the analysis in terms of geographical patterns is that the one region in which insurgency, irregular war, as a form of civil war, has remained quite resilient, unlike other areas of the world, is the Middle East and North Africa, an area which is primarily Muslim in population. So that raises that question, are we observing a shift uh, in the content of what is a revolutionary ideology and therefore a robust technology, uh, and whether the terms and the content may change, but the, the, uh, the type of war that we observe remains un unchanged. Uh, I would say that there are lo a lot of similarities between uh, the ways in which uh, Marxist, revolutionary Marxist-Leninism uh, got associated with uh, combat and war during the, po the Cold War period. Um, and uh, I would emphasize that uh, one of those uh, similarities uh, have to do with the credibility of armed struggle as a way to achieve social change, uh, which is prevalent among uh, militant uh, Islamists of the jihadi or Salafi persuasion and that was one of the very big factors that motivated people uh, of leftist ideology and radical ideology to uh, get involved uh, in uh, processes of um, armed fighting during the Cold War. There is also a tendency that has been noted by some of the students of armed jihad to, uh, for the people and the strategies of jihad to try to adopt and apply and um, adapt uh, Maoist uh, doctrine uh, broadly understood uh, to more contemporary contexts of interest to them.
But I think a very big difference between those movements uh, and the uh, leftist movements of the uh, Cold War period is the absence of a very strong and powerful external sponsor who would provide the type of assistance and support that the Soviet Union and its allies, uh, Cuba, China, Libya, in sub-Saharan Africa, provided uh, their uh, allies during the Cold War. And as a result of that, one of the very interesting uh, dissimilarities between uh, jihadi insurgencies on the one hand and Marxist-Leninist insurgencies on the other hand is that the likelihood uh, that the result, the outcome, is going to be negative for the jihadis tends to be much lower. That is, they lose insurgencies much, uh, in a much, at a much greater degree that, than was the case for the Marxist-Leninists. And this also explains the shift towards transnational terrorism. If you cannot fight and win, or at least establish uh, a presence and hope for some good results through uh, insurgency, it may be that transnational urban terrorism of the kind that we've observed with September 11 may be uh, an alternative. And we have some evidence uh, that such a shift uh, was strategically, strategically thought. Uh, but that is not very promising uh, from a perspective of um, radical Islamist, precisely because um, these uh, strategies of terrorism may have sometimes local effects that may be positive, especially when dealing with uh, foreign occupation. But uh, for the most, they do not produce uh, changes in the type of government within countries that uh, jihadis hope for. So I'm going to stop here. Uh, I'm going to thank you for your attention. I'm going to um, ask you to understand uh, why I try to compress so much information uh, in such a short amount of time. And then I'm going to take advantage of uh, uh, quite a lot of time. We have about um, almost 20 minutes to have a, uh, a q and I've been asked to repeat your questions uh, so that they can be recorded. Uh, and I'd be very happy to uh, entertain any of them. Thank you very much. Yes, please. If robust insurgency is on the way out, but terrorism isn't going to achieve any results, what's the future sort of civil warfare we're going to see? And what makes you think that that is going to be a new one? I think that the future of civil war is more likely to be of the third kind, what I called and described as symmetric, non-conventional wars, that is, uh, very low technology wars taking place uh, in very poor uh, developing countries in which the state collapses or implodes. I think these are going to be much more common uh, and much more uh, dominant uh, in terms of the numbers of civil wars that we see in the future. Uh, the uh, the uh, movement away from insurgency and towards terrorism uh, is not enough in terms of the magnitude of violence and the magnitude of organization to move a place uh, from terrorism to civil war. These terrorism incidents always hover uh, on a level of violence that's much more uh, smaller, uh, much smaller than um, levels of uh, violence and organization required for us to describe a conflict as a war. Uh, I also think that there is a probability that we uh, will have conventional wars, especially in situations in which uh, organized or slightly uh, richer states split. And there is also quite uh, uh, a large percentage these days of irregular wars as well. There are about, uh, I would say, 20 to, to 30 percent of all civil wars in the post-Cold War period tend to be uh, irregular wars. However, those wars tend to look like a lot like the um, traditional guerrilla wars and much less like the robust insurgency wars in that they very often entail uh, local indigenous peoples very often fighting against uh, the encroachment of um, settling uh, or the encroachment of um, uh, uh, attempts to, uh, in a sense, internally colonize peripheral regions. Uh, India, for example, has a very large number of those. A very small percentage of those irregular wars today tend to be also revolutionary wars of Marxist-Leninist uh, kind that have, survived the, uh, that have survived the end of the Cold War. Uh, the examples here would be the war in Nepal, uh, would be the Naxalite rebellions in India, uh, and would be also, I would also include the war uh, in Colombia. Uh, but those tend to be very small in number, and I don't think uh, that it is likely that they will dominate again uh, the civil war, um, the character of civil wars in a way they did in the Cold War. Uh, 
Uh, the uh, positive effect of this change in the character of civil wars uh, and the transformation of civil wars from primarily robust insurgencies into primitive wars is that those wars tend to be much easier uh, to um, address by uh, international actors. Uh, precisely because in those wars, the uh, armed actors involved have very little capacity for fighting and have very little connections uh, with local populations. And those connections very often are based more uh, on the use of fear uh, or of traditional networks than they're based on the ability uh, of the rebels to motivate uh, a population by providing a political project that's credible and by providing collective good. So uh, my sense is that uh, this is good news for the international community. And some of the examples uh, we have, such as the war in Sierra Leone, suggest uh, that those wars can easily be addressed. Um, but at the same time, that does not um, reduce uh, the cost of nation building that usually follows these processes. Yes? Yes, that's, so the question is, uh, what is the causal uh, mechanism that explains the transition, the change of civil wars from the Cold War to the post-Cold War period? And that was a section that I uh, moved out of the presentation to try to keep the uh, presentation below the 30-minute threshold. Uh, there are three basic mechanisms that explain uh, what made uh, civil wars robust insurgencies during the Cold War and what changes them uh, after the end of uh, the Cold War. The first has to do with funding. Uh, but funding does not mean just military resources. Uh, very often it had to do with the huge numbers of advisors, projects of reorganization of army, of militaries, and sometimes projects that were almost uh, close to um, projects of state building, so massive infusion uh, of aid uh, that gave the ability uh, either to states to become much stronger in facing the kind of criminal rebels that they face after the Civil War War, and therefore deter this kind of um, threat. But at the same time, also increase the capacity of rebels to be able to fight against moderately organized states. The states, for example, of Latin America, uh, which are not as weak as, as the states of Sub-Saharan Africa, but able to um, uh, deter uh, threats from low kind of rebels, not, however, able to deter threats from better quality rebels. So that's one uh, mechanism. The second mechanism has to do with the association of philosophy uh, and, uh, and war, the association that is the, the creation of a transnational social movement that did two things. The first thing is that it placed guerrilla war, armed conflict, it made that a credible uh, option for many radicals around the world. Uh, and with the end of the Cold War that ends, I would say that if you look um, in the 1960s and the 1970s in the developing world, uh, and sometimes in the developed world as well, uh, you see uh, a very, very lively uh, community of individuals that has transnational ties that is very much uh, composed very often of people who are students, who are intellectuals, who think very seriously about uh, guerrilla war as an option, who get uh, to go to summer schools in the summer to get some training in uh, Lebanon uh, or Cuba, uh, who uh, produce and read and discuss bestsellers, uh, and who uh, also take very seriously the third mechanism, which is the mechanism of the organizational doctrine of how you should go about and organize those wars. Uh, and that includes, uh, that in a sense raises uh, the bar for organizing this type of rebellion quite high. Because it means that people who uh, have, um, in a sense, very often either an urban ba background or very often come from rural families that have studied uh, in cities, go back to uh, the rural hinterland, organize peasants, um, 
produce, in a sense, uh, a state in areas, construct a state in areas in which a state was not present beforehand, uh, which requires quite a lot of effort, especially under conditions in which um, they are militarily outgunned uh, very often. So the Cold War, in a sense, uh, raises the capacity of some states, but raises the capacity of the rebels, especially of those kinds of, of rebels. The end of the Cold War uh, extinguishes all, all the first two mechanisms, that is the funding and the aid on the one hand, uh, puts an end to beliefs about change through military action, puts an end to the social movement that went with it. Uh, the doctrine is still there, but the doctrine is not easy to implement, precisely because of the kinds of individuals uh, it required for, um, for it to be implemented. And as a result, uh, what you have in the post-Cold War period is a sort of residual war in which the weakest of the states, the ones that were propped up during the Cold War uh, by either the Soviet Union or the United States become very exposed to the very, very low quality rebels out there. Um, I think this is a, uh, a trend uh, that a lot of the literature missed, and it, it, it was missed for two reasons, uh, or for one main reason, which is that the Cold War had contradictory effects, right? Not only did it, it raise the capacity of rebels, but it also raised the capacity of states. And because of those contradictory effects, it was very difficult to um, figure out or to predict ex ante, uh, that is, the first years after the end of the Cold War, what the situation was going to look like afterwards. Uh, and there were two types of predictions, opposites from each other. The first one, uh, and the most popular one, was that uh, the post-Cold War period was going to be uh, as Robert Kaplan, a, a very well-known journalist, called it the era of uh, coming anarchy, in which uh, the disciplinary effect of the superpowers was going, in a sense, to disappear and unleash uh, an incredible wave of these kinds of wars everywhere. And that hasn't proved to be true. The opposite was the, uh, a very optimistic view, according to which the end of superpower co uh, competition across the world was going to open the door for international intervention, for all kinds of well-meaning actors to actually reduce uh, uh, very substantially the number of civil wars. And that has not happened either. But the situation today looks closer to the positive uh, and optimistic uh, prediction than to the negative one. And as for political scientists and social scientists uh, in general, including economists who study civil wars in a quantitative way, uh, what is very interesting is that in most econometric models of civil wars, the uh, variable for the Cold War is seen uh, and is found to be insignificant. And the reason is precisely because uh, when you aggregate civil wars into one category, you miss the contradictory effects. That is, the rise of a certain type of civil wars, the collapse of another type of civil wars, which in the aggregate, in a sense, uh, cancel each other. Uh, that is completely missed. And that's why a lot of political scientists came up thinking that the Cold War and the end of the Cold War had no effect whatsoever on civil wars. Yes? Could you use Bosnia as an example of these various conflicts that you're talking about? Could you just give us some specific examples there? Yes. Bosnia is an example uh, of, a, of a civil war that is not an irregular war. It's not a robust insurgency. Bosnia can be either classified as a conventional war. It was fought with front lines, uh, with armies that had uh, tanks and artillery. Uh, the biggest battle, so to speak, uh, of the Bosnian War was the siege of Sarajevo. So it was a very static battle. Uh, the front lines were very clear. You could actually color the, the map of Bosnia with different colors depending on what side controlled what, which you cannot do in a place like Afghanistan. It's very difficult. It looks much more like a mosaic, right? Because there are overlapping zones of control. Uh, or you could say that perhaps it was one of the more primitive kinds of wars, because you had a lot of irregular fighters involved in it. Uh, my sense is that uh, if you want probably to classify it, uh, so it was a symmetric war. The two sides faced each other face to face. Uh, I would probably say it looked more like a conventional war than it looked like uh, one of these pre-modern, primitive so-called wars. Um, and I forgot to, to uh, mention the question. Uh, uh, so that is, it was not a guerrilla war by any means and by any stretch of the imagination. And very often, when you hear uh, people describing various actors in Bosnia as guerrillas, uh, you make the kind of conceptual uh, move that uh, can lead you to very, I think, uh, problematic conclusions. Please. Would you consider Somalia as an example of a failed civil war? 
Somalia, whether Somalia is uh, a failed civil war, Somalia is certainly an example of a failed state, a state that collapsed. The war in Somalia went through a variety of different phases. It started as an irregular war fought in the periphery of the country, but the government had so weak, was so weakened, especially after the Americans withdrew support following the end of the Cold War, uh, that the state collapsed in its effort to uh, fight those insurgents completely collapsed. And after, after that collapse, you have a situation in which various factions that emerged primarily from those rebels, but also factions that were associated with the former uh, state, started fighting a variety of wars uh, with each other. Somalia is also very interesting uh, as an example of a war that would have ended if it was weren't for outside <coughs> intervention. It was at two different points in time, uh, an Islamist uh, rebel faction almost won the conflict and was prevented from consolidating its, vector, its victory uh, by outside intervention, especially by United States policy, which uh, sees those rebels not necessarily as state builders, but as uh, the kind of actors who are going to provide uh, uh, a safe haven for international terrorists and therefore should, pre should be prevented from winning. But my sense is, and I'm not speaking as a specialist of the civil war in Somalia, my sense is that uh, if the war was um, allowed to take its natural course, so to speak, uh, that it would have ended uh, by this day with military victory. What's Please. Your prediction for Afghanistan? Because you seem to have described it as a robust insurgency, but it's without the sort of internal funding that you had during the war. So my qu the question is about my predictions for Afghanistan. And obviously, I cannot venture these kind of predictions. I would say that Afghanistan looks very much like uh, the robust insurgencies of past times. Uh, there is a substitute which is not enough, um, but which allows, uh, gives some room for maneuver for the insurgents, which is the, uh, the use of Pakistan um, as a safe haven, but also the support that the insurgents have from various segments, uh, including uh, parts of, uh, of the secret services in Pakistan. Uh, it seems like a, a typical war of attrition. Uh, the Taliban do not have any chance of uh, being able to storm the cities. But at the same time, it seems to me that uh, the requirements for effective counterinsurgency in the traditional way, that is establishing control in the thousands of villages across the mountainous, mountainous terrains of Afghanistan are just staggering. And I don't see how it is possible to be effective um, and I don't see the kind of dynamic that uh, took place in Iraq, in which uh, basically the traditional component of the uh, anti-American insurgency uh, in the Sunni heartland basically defected from the philosophers, if you wish, if you wish of, of that revolutionary actor that is the, the Al-Qaeda. Um, I don't see whether uh, and how that can happen in Afghanistan. It doesn't seem very likely. Please. So this is a very good and, and, uh, and very interesting question about uh, the timing of the emergence of, of uh, a jihadi set of insurgencies, uh, given that uh, Islam as a religion and perhaps even Islamist as, as an ideology have been around for a much longer time. And now that causes me uh, difficulty in responding because we have some specialists in the room uh, who are probably going to uh, find what I have to say uh, uh, not very thoughtful, uh, which is normal because I'm not a specialist uh, of uh, the Islamist movements. But my sense is the following one. Um, Islamist insurgency as an armed, uh, as armed militancy is a recent development. That is the idea uh, of organizing and fighting not just to repel foreign invaders, but to change the character of society seems to be quite, quite uh, quite, re re uh, quite recent. And what is very interesting is that uh, if you look before, uh, say, uh, the 1980s, before the Soviet invasion in Afghanistan, uh, 
the revolutionary component uh, in the Arab world was not very different than the revolutionary component in the rest of the developing world. That is, uh, there was a very strong tendency uh, for ideas described as nationalist, pan-Arabist, socialist, uh, to be very common and very uh, attractive in the Arab world. Um, and I can give you as an example the uh, Algerian War of Independence, uh, which even though uses uh, a vocabulary that sometimes refer to Islam as a, uh, an identity marker and uh, a religion, a traditional religion, is an ideology that very much emphasizes um, the kind of political ideology that we associate with, uh, if not Marxist, but certainly uh, a sort of a form of socialism. So, one has to understand, I think, in order to understand the transition of, um, in a sense of radicalism in the Arab world away from the left and towards uh, jihad, one has to understand, first of all, uh, the defeat of Arab nationalism in various conflicts, the end of the Cold War and the collapse of the prestige that associate, was associated uh, with the Soviet Union, and finally the effects uh, of the uh, Soviet inv invasion in Afghanistan. So, um, and that, uh, I think, also illustrates the fact that um, Islamism as a political movement is relatively new and should not be confused with Islam as a religion or as a, a set of uh, moral attitudes, uh, which is very old. Yes? That is, you talk about uh, different kinds of civil wars over time, but you didn't say much about the number of civil wars over time. Could you say something uh, about whether the trend has been going up over time or down over time, or if there's been some ups and downs when you control for the number of states? Uh, and could you tell us what explains the ups and downs and what that means for the future? Yes, that's a very, uh, very good question. Uh, it's a question about uh, numerical quantitative trends over time. Uh, I'm going to uh, try to answer it very quickly since we're also running out of time. Uh, if we look at the uh, period of um, uh, after 1945, uh, we have two spikes. We have a spike in the 1960s, which is associated with a lot of the anti-colonial conflicts, and we have a spike in the immediate post-Cold War period, which is associated uh, with the collapse of the Soviet Union. If you try to normalize those trends, what you find, and, and compare the Cold War period with the post-Cold War period, you find that there is uh, um, a decline of civil wars, which I think is associated with a decline uh, of um, robust insurgency. But of course, it's still too early to say whether this is going to be um, a permanent trend. But certainly, I would say that compared to the Cold War, the numbers suggest a decline of civil wars. Now, if we extend our frame uh, to the pre uh, 19, to the 19th century and the, and the first part of the 20th century, one challenge that emerges is that it's very difficult to count wars because uh, of various um, uh, difficulties of um, agreeing on exactly what is a civil war. Uh, the correlates of war, for example, uh, includes a, numbers of, a number of Indian wars in the United States in their catalog of um, internal conflicts. Uh, if you take this very uh, large view of civil wars, you find that there is an increase. There is a large number of civil wars in the 19th century associated with wars of colonial conquest. Then the numbers of wars goes down. So the first uh, part of the uh, 20th century doesn't have many of those. And then, of course, you can think of the decolonization period as a period in which precisely because we have the formation of new states through a lot of those conflicts, those numbers go up again. And you can think of the uh, first post-Cold War period spike in civil wars as also reflecting processes of empire collapse and new state formation. So you can uh, make an argument that there is a logic uh, associate, associating civil wars with processes of state formation uh, and empire collapse. Um, and if that's true, of course, that would require us, uh, if we want to make predictions for the future, to understand and be able to predict what those processes of state consolidation and state collapse would be, which I don't think we understand very well. Now, putting that trend aside, and if we focus uh, on just the Cold War and the post-Cold War period, and emphasizing uh, trends that are uh, much less long-term, my sense is that uh, we are facing a decline of those wars. And in fact, I would argue uh, 
that the uh, adventures of Iraq and Afghanistan probably are going to reinforce this trend by, in a sense, making it much more costly, uh, or at least uh, making the perception of these kinds of military uh, and, uh, operations um, much less likely to, to, uh, to happen in the future. I'm told that we have to stop here in order to prepare the room for the next uh, talk. So I would like to thank everyone uh, of you for coming here, and especially for the very thoughtful questions. Thank you very much.